Well, without further ado, I'm handing over to Professor Bogdanor for a most interesting talk. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. And uh, this is the book you mentioned. I don't know whether people can see it. It's published by the Yale University Press. And I don't really want to go over the um, same themes in the book, but perhaps to carry my thinking a little further. They're based on lectures given two years ago. So I hope I've had some more thoughts since then. Um, but the central theme of the book is that Brexit was neither an aberration for Britain as a whole, nor for the European Union. And I really want to concentrate on the second part of that. But um, at the end, perhaps um, with this particular audience, I might make one or two comments about Scotland and the European Union, because as I understand it, the Scottish National Party would like to see an independent Scotland back in the European Union. But one preliminary point I would like to make, which may surprise some people uh, in the audience, is that Brexit has not led to the inward looking nationalistic Britain, which many feared, particularly hasn't led to an insular and nativist Britain. And one remarkable and perhaps unexpected consequence of Brexit is that it has liberated Britain's liberal political culture. Let me give some examples of what I mean. As you know, during the um, referendum in 2016, the issue of immigration played a very large part. Indeed, it's probably true to say that was the main policy issue that the Brexiteers um, concentrated upon. Now, uh, the EU principle of free movement was something they objected to. But since Brexit, so far from there having been an anti-immigrant backlash, attitudes towards immigrants have softened. And immigration has lost its high salience and is now a much more positive attitude towards it. It appears the British public are not against immigration per se, but against uncontrolled immigration. They want immigration managed, but not ended. Let me give an example. In 2019, an Ipsos Mori poll across 27 countries asked whether immigration has generally had a positive impact. And 48% in Britain said it had, which is more than the other 26. Then the Migration Observatory at Oxford, my old university, in 2020 uh, made this statement. Few or no immigrants of a different race should be allowed to enter the country. The response in Britain was 26%, the lowest in the European Union apart from Sweden and a little lower than, for example, Germany. And, and migrants in Britain are much less likely to be unemployed um, than in Germany, Austria, Netherlands or Sweden. Now, when we left the European Parliament, the European Parliament lost a third of its non-white members. We had more non-white members than any other country. 19 out of the 28 had none at all. And we are sixth proportionately in Europe in, in terms of the amount of foreign aid we give. We give more proportionally and in absolute terms than Germany. And I think above all, we have no racist party represented in parliament like the AFD in Germany, which is the official opposition, Front National in France. Um, worth saying that in the last presidential election, nearly half of 18 to 24 year olds voted for Marine Le Pen in the second ballot of the elections. And more young voters, in fact, supported her than voters in any other age group. Italy has Salvini. And in Sweden, the Sweden Democrats deny the government a majority, let alone Orban of Hungary and Kaczynski of Poland. So um, uh, it's worth uh, asking whether Brexit, oh, let me say I didn't vote for it, I voted to remain, but the Brexit might have proved a means by which Britain has avoided populism. And uh, one of the issues I want to discuss is whether there are trends in the European Union that are, <coughs> excuse me, that are in fact leading to populism. Now, was Brexit an aberration in the European Union? <coughs> it wasn't an aberration in this, in this sense, but it's unlikely to be followed by the exit of any other member state. <coughs> One obvious candidate for exit, perhaps, is Greece, 
but I don't think she will leave for two reasons. The first is that for her, as for many other countries in the European Union, uh, the EU symbolizes an emergence from dictatorship and the acceptance of Greece as a European democracy. <clears throat> the second is there's not really any alternative for a small country. Now, Britain believed, perhaps mistakenly, that she did have an alternative option. Now, you may say, well, it's not precisely clear what that option is, but still, many believed it was there. It may be Sweden, Denmark think they have an alternative option. The Euroscepticism is fairly strong there, but I, I, I think it's unlikely. But I do think, nevertheless, that Brexit is a real pointer to weaknesses in the structure of the European Union. <clears throat> and this is something I first wrote about many years ago. Um, I wrote about it in a book entitled Elitism, Populism and European Politics, edited by Jack Hayward, who was a professor at Oxford, where I was for many years. <clears throat> and in, this was written at about the time of the Maastricht Treaty of 1992 more than 30 years ago. And um, I contrasted the large majorities for the Maastricht Treaty in the member states and the results of various surveys of voter opinion with the actual outcomes when voters were asked to pronounce on Europe. Now Denmark rejected the Maastricht Treaty, which wasn't a surprise perhaps, and Denmark voted for it in a second referendum after some minor amendments were made to the treaty. But the referendum in France was more of a surprise. It was positive, but only by 51 to 49 percent. And that was a surprise because France was thought to be a country at the very heart of the European Union. And the Maastricht Treaty was supported by all the major parties in France, except for the Front National. And in the voting, the moderates of the left and the right uh, moderate left and right voters supported it, but ex the extremes on left and right were against it, and um, the extremes were much stronger than many people thought. Now, if you look at Britain and Germany at the time, there were no referendums and all the major parties favoured the treaty, but even so, survey evidence indicated it was by no means certain that Maastricht would have been endorsed had it been put to the popular vote. And I suggested at the time that the European Union was giving rise to that most dangerous and intractable of cleavages, that between the political class and the people. And that's the cleavage that gives rise to populist parties when these parties can say, the establishment is all united, they don't represent you. Whether you vote Conservative or Labour makes no difference. Uh, they're, they're, they're together, plague on all their houses. And that's been that was said really by Farage's party and uh, Trump um, in America in a different way, perhaps by the Scottish Nationalist Party. I'm not calling let me hasten out a populist party, but it's saying that the differences between Labour and Conservative don't really matter that much. The key issue is whether you're really a proud national Scot or not. So um, I think all this cast doubt on the central purpose of the European. Union, which was to create European unity, that nationalism seemed much stronger. And I suggested that this popular dis disenchantment, if not checked, would uh, cause serious problems. And since I wrote it, the rejection in 2005 of the EU constitution or proposed EU constitution by France and the Netherlands, two of the countries assumed to be at the heart of the European project, has confirmed my view. And the 2008 credit crunch has led, as did the Wall Street crash in 1929, to a revival of nationalism and populism and a weakening in philosophies of internationalism, social democracy and Christian democracy in many countries, not only in the EU, let me say. Now, the EU leaders, I think, have done very little to counter popular alienation from the project. Perhaps they haven't, in fact, read my chapter. Now, Brexit challenges what might be called the ideology of Europe because it's a serious matter for any democratic organization when a major member state decides to leave. And President Macron of France uh, gave an interview on BBC in early 2017 when he, he was very honest. He said he couldn't guarantee you wouldn't get the same result in France as you had in Britain if there was a referendum. And he said the European Union must respond to Brexit <clears throat> 
with appropriate institutional and other reforms. And I'll be looking at some of those other reforms a bit later. And Donald Tusk, uh, the former president of the European Council, declared as president in 2016 after the referendum, it would be a fatal error to assume that the negative result in the UK referendum represents a specifically British issue. The Brexit vote is a desperate attempt to answer the question, the question that millions of Europeans ask themselves daily. And before the referendum, Tusk had said the EU needs to take a long, hard look at itself and listen to the British warning signal. Now, I think the central problem of the EU is it's been unable to represent the people of Europe effectively. Now, the essence of a democratic political organization is that it represents. And representation is, of course, a key concept in, in Britain. And you may argue it's at the very core of what it means to be British. You may argue to be British is to wish to continue to be represented in the House of Commons. And uh, of course, if you're a nationalist, if you you're supported the SNP, I think that proves my point because they are saying, well, we do go to Westminster, but we don't want to continue to be represented there. Uh, we want to uh, get independence to Scotland so we can take our MPs away, as the Irish did after the First World War, and be fully self-governing in Edinburgh. Now, the idea of representation does imply that decisions are made by a majority and the minority accept that. Uh, a minority, no doubt, hoping to become the majority at the next election. So there must be some degree of homogeneity or unity amongst the electorate. Uh, Hobbes in Leviathan says, a multitude of men are made one person when they are by one man or one person represented. Now, of course, some minorities don't accept that. And I mentioned the Scottish nationalists. They don't say we are a minority in Britain. They say we're a majority in Scotland. And that's what the Sinn Féin MPs in Ireland did in the 1918 election. They said, we, we don't recognize Westminster, we'll boycott it. And Sinn Féin still boycotts it. And the SNP don't, of course, boycott it, but they don't see themselves as part of a minority. Now, perhaps there's some analogy between the position of the SNP as they see themselves in Westminster and our position in the EU. We didn't really see ourselves as part of that whole. Perhaps we didn't feel we had enough in common with the other member states, just as the SNP doesn't feel it had enough in common with people south of the border, that we didn't want to enter with the other European member states with them into a political union and accept common laws and policies. Now, um, this was an issue I think obscured when we entered in 1973 and the Heath government issued a statement saying that it involved no sacrifice of essential national sovereignty. And that begs two questions. The first is what is essential on which people might disagree, but secondly, perhaps more important, the powers and obligations of the European Union were not at that time at least a closed category which could be defined in advance. They were going to be developed. They're going to be new common policies. Now, until the introduction of the principle of subsidiarity in the Maastricht Treaty, perhaps not even then, there was no inherent limit to the common policies which the EU might adopt. By contrast with federal states, such as America, there was no states' rights clause in the EU structure. Uh, the um, American constitution has such a clause in the 10th amendment, which says that anything not done by the EU is reserved, by, sorry, by the federal government is reserved to the states. Now, our debate when we entered was only about what might be called peripheral committee stage type issues, the length of the transition period, the contribution to the EU budget and so on, the terms, if you like, but not the basic principle did we wish to merge our fortunes with a new political unit? Now, after we joined, we had all sorts of problems, as you all know, and the, the basic issue was avoided through patching up. Margaret Thatcher's budget negotiations, which, in, which resulted in a rebate agreed in 1984, 
and various contrivances, in particular many opt-outs we had, and also the Conservatives had a special relationship with the European People's Party, which is committed to a federal Europe, which of course the Conservatives are not, but they were allowed special leeway. But we were never made to face up to the full implications of political union. Very interestingly, we thought with Poland, we had an opt-out on the European Charter of Fundamental Rights. But the Benkhar Bush case of 2017, decided by the Supreme Court uh, here, um, uh, uh, as important, I think, constitution is fact to tame, showed that we didn't, that we were as much subject to the charter as every other member state. And that surely follows from the logic of political union, because how can a genuine community have different standards of rights in different parts of that community? Now, in Britain, there's been some discontent, not in Scotland so much, but south of the border, in the European Convention of Human Rights, and the government has set up a review committee to consider its implications. But the European Union Charter is much more far reaching than the convention with 54 articles. I'll, I'll give some brief examples. An article 13 right to academic freedom, which of course I value very much. An article 14 right to vocation and continual training. A specific article 21 right to non-discrimination on grounds such as sex, race, color ethnic or social origin, genetic features, language, religion or belief, political or any other opinion, membership of a national minority, property, birth, disability, age or sexual orientation. And this article, unlike the European Convention, provides explicit protection for members of the LGBT community. Article 24, rights of the child, Article 25, rights of the elderly. There's a huge, uh, Catalog, Article 34, right to social security, Article 35, right to health care, Article 38, right to environmental protection. Now, I wonder if people in Britain were really prepared to accept the implication of this charter. I think um, in passing, I might mention, I believe the Scots are much keener on I believe, I, I'm open to correction, the, the SNP want to incorporate the charter into the um, uh, provisions of the Scotland Act insofar as they affect devolved matters, but I, I'm open to correction on that. I know they're much more sympathetic to the European Convention than England is. But my, my broad question is, to what extent would we have been prepared to accept the implications? And all this illustrates my point, that a presupposition of effective representation is that those represented feel they belong to a single community, and that is what makes majority rule acceptable. Now, there is a second requirement for effective representation. It is that there be an effective party system. Disraeli famously said, you cannot have parliamentary government unless you have party government. There must be parties broadly united on matters of public policy, competing parties, so the executive can be accountable to the legislature in which they are represented. And if we do not like one government of one party, we can turn it out and replace it with another. You couldn't do that easily, I think, if parties were purely regional. If there was one party, say, in the north of Britain and another party of the south, uh, it'd be difficult because the south might always have a majority. It'd be difficult for either party to win over floating voters. And the same is true with a party system based on religion or nationality, such as you had in Northern Ireland uh, under Stormont, the old Stormont, between 1922 and 72. There was no real possibility of an alternative government since the unionists who were predominantly protestant were a permanent majority so democracy requires some alternative system sometimes called consociational democracy which northern ireland now has a system of power sharing now party secures a broad correspondence between the views of the government and those of the electorate not perfect certainly under our electoral system not perfect but broadly and uh, clearly a parliament of 650 independents couldn't do that, nor could a parliament composed of chance and contingent majorities, as was the case with the parliaments of the Fourth and Fifth Republics in France and possibly Italy today. Now, can these ideas of representation be made effective in the EU? Now, the EU, of course, a difficult organisation to understand. Uh, I think Madeleine Albright, the former American Secretary of State, once said, to understand the EU, you have to be either a genius or French. Now, I'm neither, but I shall do my best. 
Now, an Italian political scientist called Sergio Fabrini has written that the European Union is like the United States, what he calls a compound democracy. And by that, he means a political system divided not only territorially along federal type lines, but with a division of powers at the center. In the United States, between the President, Congress and Supreme Court, in Europe, between the Council, the Commission of Parliament and the European Court of Justice. Now, of course, there are huge differences between the two political systems, but the one I want to concentrate on is that in the Europe, there's no um, analogy uh, in America to a main institution in the European Union, which is the Commission that is not directly elected, but is given the sole power of legislative initiative. And that we find difficult to understand because we think the power of legislative initiative should be given only to those who've been elected. It's a political power. And we have, as they do in Canada, Australia, and New Zealand, a broad separation of powers between those who are elected and accountable to Parliament, um, who form the government, and civil servants who are not accountable to Parliament, who are career officials, non-partisan, neutral, and serve governments of any political colour. And of course, you have that in Scotland. If the SNP were defeated in the elections to Holyrood, then the civil service would serve just as loyally a conservative, Labour, or Liberal Democrat, or coalition administration, whatever it is. Um, so um, we find it difficult to understand the continental conception of the unelected politician or the elected official. And many years ago, I heard a conservative MP address a member of the commission, the late Mr. Finn Gundelach, as an official. And Mr. Gundelach bristled, and I suspect that Jacques Delors would have bristled even more. But we don't understand how a non-elected person can enjoy such wide powers as those wielded by Delors. Now, the commission has admittedly become weaker since the end of the Lord's reign in 1995, he was the most activist president of the commission that Europe has known. But nevertheless, it does retain a distinctly political power. Now, how can you get effective representation and democratic accountability in a system of this kind? Well, there are two answers. The first is by analogy with other separation of power systems, such as the American or the French, where there's a unifying element in the direct election of the executive the presidential system. Now that system, just like the British system of parliamentary representation, requires a fairly unified and homogenous community. Now, America in its history, of course, had a problem in this regard because in 1861, the Southern states declared they were not a minority in the United States, but a majority of their own in a new Confederate nation which they sought to create. And Gladstone said the South had created a nation, and possibly on grounds of self-determination, he was right. But whatever the arguments, the North had superior force, and so the indissoluble federal union came into existence. Now, the second method of securing accountability is through a parliamentary, parliamentary method, through a European parliament elected as it is by universal suffrage, and through a broadly common, roughly similar electoral system. That itself raises two problems. The first is the problem of what is the EU executive which is responsible to the European Parliament? What is the common government and to whom it is accountable? Now, the founding fathers, such as Jean Monnet, believed that the Commission would be that government and that in a un unified Europe, the Council of Ministers representing the member states would be the upper house of the European Parliament on the model of the Bundesrat in Germany, which represents the German states. And Angela Merkel, speaking to the European Parliament in November 2010, reiterated that view, and she actually predicted the Commission would eventually become the government of the EU. Now, uh, if you hold that view, the Commission must be not what it is now a, a commission representing broadly all streams of opinion in Europe, but a partisan commission representing the left or the right. And that would mean if the European Parliament doesn't like its policies, it could remove the commission and replace it with one more to its liking. 
or if the voters do not approve of the commission, they can turn it out through their votes at the next European election and replace it by another. In addition, if a commissioner makes a mistake, as Ursula von der Leyen did over vaccinations, she would be accountable to the European Parliament through a vote of confidence, as ministers are both in, in London and in Holyrood. Now, perhaps the von der Leyen mistake uh, in invoking Article 16 of the Northern Ireland Protocol to prevent EU vaccines coming into Britain via Northern Ireland casts a shaft of light on the central weakness of the institutional structure of the EU. Because does it not show the failure to anticipate public reactions, both in Britain and in Ireland, is dangerous for a body which is only indirectly accountable, if at all, to the people, and whose members have not had to undergo the gamut of popular and media scrutiny. Now, some argue the Commission is too much peopled with politicians who, to put it mildly, have not always been successful at national level. And in the parliamentary system, someone who makes a mistake of this sort would be immediately met with a no confidence motion. That didn't happen with Miss van der Leyen. And um, her name was not before the voters of Europe in the 2019 European Parliament election. No one voted for her. And apparently she didn't even apply for the post as president of the Commission. Now, in theory, the transnational political parties in the e European Parliament could yield left or right coalitions which would make accountability of the Commission feasible. But a partisan Commission would, of course, be a great innovation and would alter its role. It would no longer be a kind of neutral power over and above the member states, a body dedicated to the common good, rather like the body in the Fourth French Republic, the Commissaire du Plan, from which the idea of the Commission derives. That Commissaire, incidentally, was chaired by Jean Monnet, and I think that's where he got the idea. But parliamentary accountability in the EU requires, as I've said, a fairly homogenous and unified electorate in the 27 member states. It would entail that Europe had genuinely become a community. Now, perhaps it was when it was founded in 1958 with six member states, excluding Britain, of course. And perhaps if there was an inner core of just a few member states which favoured further integration, uh, it might be a community. But it, it isn't merely a community amongst 27 states. I think we're very far from that. Now, all sorts of measures have been produced with the purpose of helping to make Europe a political community, a customs union, which helped make Germany a political community in the 19th century, the so-called Zollverein, direct elections to the European Parliament, the creation of transnational political parties, creation of the single market, creation of the single currency, co-decision of the European Parliament with the Council, the Spitzen candidate idea, and now banking and fiscal union. But none of them have succeeded in achieving the aim of securing a unified and homogenous European community. All were thought to be game changes, but none of them have in fact been. They have not succeeded. The main divisions in the EU remain those between member states. On burden sharing between the so-called Hanseatic states led by the Netherlands and others, on the use of the rule of law between the ex-communist states in the East and those in the West. There is not that sense of common and unified allegiance needed for a system of parliamentary accountability to work. And the transformation from a technocratic to a political system, other than a confederal system, cannot, I suspect, be achieved by institutional reforms at all, but only by a slow transformation of the culture of the European electorate into a more homogenous whole. And that's likely to be a long process. Now, some federal states have sped up that process by the use of force after the wars. In America, I've already mentioned, Germany with Bismarck's wars, and Switzerland with the war in the 1840s. But a war is not really an option, I think, available to the European Union. So it follows. The European Parliament does not have the same relationship to the peoples of Europe that domestic legislators have to their own peoples. Most Europeans continue to give primary allegiance to the legislatures of their member state, not the European Parliament, whose elections attract a much smaller turnout. People feel more represented by their national parliaments 
rather than the European Parliament. And some see the European Parliament as representing not the European people, but the political class, them and not us. It seems remote from those whom it seems to represent. And indeed, many in Europe do not know who their MEP actually is. I wonder, I won't ask to embarrass anyone, but I wonder if those in the audience, especially those who were enthusiastic about the European Union, could have named who their MEPs were when we were actually in the European Union. But <clears throat> as I say, I won't embarrass the audience by asking for a show of hands. Now, the Commission is not only geographically remote like the Parliament, it's also institutionally remote because not chosen by the people of Europe, inherently remote. And it's seen even more than the Parliament as part of an alienated superstructure. In practice, of course, the real decision-making body of the EU is the Council of Ministers, the executive. <coughs> and that can't be responsible to the European Parliament because it's composed of ministers of the member states responsible to their own parliaments. And it's only accountable to the voters in a very indirect way. <clears throat> no doubt in theory, it would be possible for each of the 27 states um, to remove their governments and replace them with 27 other governments committed to a different policy in Europe. <clears throat> but that's unlikely. So the European Parliament can't in practice replace one EU executive with another or one set of policies with another, nor can European voters. <clears throat> and the council clearly isn't accountable to national parliaments once majority voting was introduced. With a veto, you could be, because you could say to a minister, why didn't you use your veto? But <clears throat> now with qualified majority voting, the minister might say, well, I argued against, but was overruled. And no one can tell whether the minister did argue against or how effectively he or she argued. So national legislatures can't really scrutinize the council. And if a legislature can't scrutinize a process, how can the people, how can the people say, we do not like what you've done. We want an alternative policy. So the council remains outside the area of political challenge. It is difficult to make it accountable before decisions are made since they are to be the subject of negotiation. And governments say, as John Major famously did in 1997 in relation to the common currency, Please don't tie my hands in the negotiations. Trust me to get the best possible deal for the country. Now, Parliament could perhaps in theory seek to limit the scope of what a government can do. And sometimes Westminster did that. And it's often done in Denmark, I think, which has special machinery because they have regular minority governments, which the single chamber of Parliament wants to bind. But I don't think the EU could operate if all 27 governments were to work in that fashion. Now, after when negotiations have been completed, it's very difficult for a legislature to untie the package. So national parliaments are commentators on the process, rather than bodies to which their governments are accountable. So there's a power shift from national parliaments to national governments, national executives, and the powers of each government come to be shared with the governments of the other member states, powers external to themselves, of which national parliaments and national electorates have little control. Now, I mentioned earlier President Macron, and he's put some, some wide ranging proposals forward for the reform of Europe. In a speech in the Sorbonne in September 2017, and a further speech to French ambassadors shortly afterwards. He said there should be reform of the Eurozone so as to secure a coordinated European economic policy and a common budget under the control of a common minister and subject to parliamentary control at European level. He also advocated convergence on tax and social policies. Now past crises in Europe have indeed led to further integration and there's some talk today about a conference on the future of Europe, the relaunching of the European Union much talk of new economic and budgetary instruments to place the euro on stronger foundations, some talk of a fiscal union. And COVID has already led to an extension of the EU's reach with a 750 billion euro recovery fund. The EU is now borrowing and redistributing money, it's something fairly new, and for the first time it's agreed to a common fiscal response to an economic shock. 
And this is seen by some as the first step towards fiscal union. But if what I've said is right, the more common policies the EU develops, the more remote it becomes from national governments and the people. More common policies, therefore, in my view, are dangerous. Now, suppose the EU were to embrace fiscal union so that it rather than national governments made decisions on tax policy. What would be left for national governments and general elections? After all, these issues of economic policy are the issues on which domestic elections are fought. Monetary policy, interest rates, exchange rates, fiscal policy, tax rates. Now, that wouldn't matter if the EU had acquired the same sort of allegiance that federal states have, such as Germany, <clears throat> the United States, Canada and Australia. But really, as we've seen, I think it hasn't. So Brussels would be developing a fiscal capacity without the politics needed to hold itself to account. The EU would have become an economic entity without the political infrastructure. And that would increase popular alienation from the EU and strengthen the appeal of populist parties. And for this reason, further integration seems to me the very last thing that Europe needs. There's a fundamental contrast between the EU and federal states. In federal states, to transfer powers, say to the American government, the German government, and so on, is uh, to transfer it to an accountable government elected. In Europe, it isn't. It's to transfer powers, in effect, to an indirectly elected council of ministers, which means further isolation from the people. Let me repeat my quotation from Thomas Hobbes. A multitude of men are made one person when they are by one man or one person represented. Has the EU succeeded in creating that one person from a multitude? Clearly not. In consequence, populist parties have resurrected the question, who in fact represents the people, the European Parliament or national parliaments? The answer I fear is obvious. And I also fear that the more common policies the EU develops, the more targets there will be for the populist parties. The more policies that are transferred to the European level, the greater the democratic deficit. Ministers will have to say even more than they do now, not me, chum, I'm sorry you don't like this policy, but there's nothing I can do about it, and nothing you can do about it. Even if you change the government, it won't make any difference, because the limits on national accountability are also the limits on the ability of voters to alter policies of which they may disapprove. And this leaves a vacuum which the populist parties have sought to fill. And it's clear to me the problems faced by voters who've come to support the radical right in Europe, economic deprivation, unregulated markets, housing, educational inequalities, undermining of local communities, lack of social mobility and so on, these problems must be resolved at domestic level, not at the level of Europe. Now, it's not surprising, perhaps, there are fundamental structural weaknesses in the whole EU project, because the basic principles were laid down over 60 years ago in 1957 in the Treaty of Rome, perhaps even earlier in the European coal and steel community in 1950 in very different conditions. Now, if you'd bought a set, a car or radio set then, how useful would it be today? Now, I think the institutional remoteness of the EU is not an accident. It was inherent in the conception of European integration held by Jean Monnet, its founding father. Now, Monnet was a great man who understood that European unity could not be achieved by goodwill. Goodwill needed instead to be embodied in common policies and common institutions. But he exercised his influence from behind the scenes. He never in his life held any elected position. And perhaps it was for this reason he never fully appreciated that political legitimacy was secured primarily by direct election, a principle fundamental to the British conception of parliamentary government. The epigraph to Monet's memoirs declares, we are not forming coalitions between states, but union among peoples. But the people he had in mind were the elites who would construct Europe by stealth, using economic means to lock nation states together, with the people perhaps being almost unaware of the process until it had become irreversible. He hoped to achieve a united Europe without it being wholly noticed by the people. That might have been possible 
in the more deferential Europe of the 1950s, when the leaders led and the followers followed, and an era when unelected officials enjoyed great prestige, it is hardly possible in the Europe of today. Now, in this Sorbonne speech of 2017, President Macron declared the founding fathers built Europe in isolation of the people because they were an enlightened vanguard. But as he then went on to say, European democratic doubt put an end to that chapter. And I think we were wrong to move for Europe forward in spite of the people. We must stop being afraid of the people. We must simply stop building an isolation from them. My basic proposition then is that the European Union needs to confront the problem of the democratic deficit and that the greater the integration, the greater the danger. <coughs> Monet did not see this. Another Frenchman, President de Gaulle, did see it. And some French Gaullists have suggested bringing the Commission under the control of the European Council, which represents the government of the member states. The power to initiate legislation should be transferred from the Commission to the Council, which would then be seen to be the executive of the EU. The Commission would become a secretariat of the Council and would lose the power to initiate legislation. Such a reform would help to undermine Euroscepticism, which thrives on the anathema of an unelected and unaccountable legislative body, something that we in Britain in particular found difficult to understand or accept. Now, the Monet de Law conception of Europe which was responsible for the early successes of European unity is now coming to appear moribund. And as long ago as 1990, when the law told the European Parliament at Strasbourg that he wanted Europe to become a true federation by the end of the millennium, French President Mitterrand, watching a speech on television, burst out, but that's ridiculous. What's he up to? No one in Europe would ever want that. By playing the extremist, he's going to wreck what's achievable. Now, you may find this ironic, but there's a sense in which Brexit Britain, together with Gaullist France, could be said to have been in the vanguard of European development, rather than hindrances to it, because they appreciated Britain, thanks to her long evolutionary history, and the Gaullists, as a result of France's experiences during the Second World War, what the sacrifice of sovereignty would actually mean in practice. Some member states, especially those which had recently emerged from dictatorships, did not fully appreciate what the sacrifice of sovereignty would in fact mean in practice. It was easy for them to say rhetorically that they favored sacrificing sovereignty, but the new Hanseatic League led by the Netherlands when it comes to sharing debts, Greece when it came to budgetary restrictions, and the Visegrad countries of Central Europe, Czech Republic, Hungary, Poland, Slovakia, when it came to accepting a due quota of Syrian migrants, all found that their acceptance of shared sovereignty was subject to very strict limits. Questions affecting the fundamental national identity of member states cannot be settled by the qualified majority voting introduced in the Single European Act of 1996, with all issues relating to the single market. So my conclusion is that Europe can only be unified on a confederal basis. What are the realities of Europe, de Gaulle asks in his memoirs, what are the pillars on which it can be built? The truth is these pillars are the states of Europe. It, Europe will remain what de Gaulle called a Europe des Etats. But a confederal Europe would be an intergovernmental organization with a difference because member states would consider not only their own national interests, but the interests of Europe as a whole. The continent has suffered in the past from the absence of such a transnational perspective. Had it been there in 1914, had the states of Europe considered the interests of the continent as a whole, rather than restricting their gaze to their own national ambitions, war would have been avoided. Perhaps then it is de Gaulle rather than Jean Monnet who should be regarded as the prophet of today's Europe, and perhaps in a confederal Europe, Britain could have an honored place, which it does not have in the European Union, moving towards integration, towards ever closer union. Now, I don't think it will ever achieve that end. Now, let me add as a coda to my talk, how all this might apply to Scotland. Now, when discussing um, Scottish nationalism, 
I used to speak of Scottish separatism, and uh, I was taken to task by the SNP, and they were right to take me to task because um, an independent Scotland would not be separate. Uh, it would be not part of the United Kingdom, but it would be part of the European Union. Um, I should perhaps say this is a comparatively new policy for the Scottish National Party. In the first EU referendum in 1975, the SNP was the only party in Scotland recommending that Britain should leave the European Union or European communities it was then. Uh, they said that Europe was even more remote than Westminster from Scotland's point of view. And um, the fear then in the referendum, oddly enough, in 1975 was that the fear the opposite to that of 2016, that the rest of Britain would vote yes to stay in Europe, but Scotland would vote no, though in the event Scotland did vote yes, and only the Shetland Isles and um, the Western Isles voted to leave. But the SNP has, in my view, a paradoxical um, uh, stance because it wants to leave a loosely organized European community in 1975, but wants to stay in a much more tightly integrated European Union. And um, it's odd in a way, it seems to me, that a national or nationalist movement wants to call in an outside power to help it in, in running its affairs. Now, the Scotland would face the same question as Britain faced. Does, does she have enough in common with the other 27 member states? Would her interests be better guaranteed by the 27 states than Westminster? Let's look first at representation, where Scotland has 59 out of the 650 seats in Westminster. And certainly the SNP would not wish to form a government, but Scotland can sometimes have a government uh, in accordance with its majority views, as of course it did with Labour in between 1997-2010, earlier Labour governments, and then the Conservatives in 1955, when the, uh, a majority both of seats and voters supported the Conservatives. So in, in the United Kingdom, Scotland belongs to a parliament to which government is accountable. Now in the European Union, Scotland would belong to an organisation whose decisions as we have seen are not accountable, either to the European Parliament nor to Holyrood and therefore not to the voters and the limits to accountability would as it would Britain be also the limits to the power of Scotland's voters. The powers of Scotland's government would be shared with other governments external to itself over which it has no control and of course some powers would go back to the European Union primarily fisheries and agriculture and from this point of view Brexit meant a restoration of power for Scotland because devolution of agriculture and fisheries didn't mean much when policy in these areas was decided in Brussels. Now Scotland hasn't got as much devolution as it wanted in these areas. The Scotland Act says that all powers in those areas should go back to Scotland, but some powers have been retained at Westminster for good or ill. But nevertheless, returning to the EU would weaken devolution in Scotland and weaken it further if Scotland joined the euro, the common currency and matters flowing from that, how to do with inflation, for example. Scotland's current budget debt is 8% under the eurozone rules. It would have to be reduced to 3%. And I fear the policies needed to reduce it to 3% would make George Osborne uh, look a bit like Santa Claus or Father Christmas, because they would involve very heavy expenditures in, um, sorry, very heavy cuts in public expenditure or heavy uh, tax uh, rises. Now, um, it's worth remembering that the freedom we had from being out of the Eurozone enabled Gordon Brown at the time of the currency, uh, the, the credit crunch uh, of 2007-8 to devalue the pound in effect by 25%, which I think reduced unemployment, certainly compared with the Eurozone countries. Now, um, the EU can, of course, develop more common policies. I've said there's no obvious limit to the powers and obligations which Scotland has to accept in advance. And so with more economic powers under the EU, Scotland might have as little autonomy in economic affairs as she has under Westminster. 
And also the SNP defence policy might be under threat if the EU develops with some wishing to do a common defence and foreign policy. And then of course, there's a hard border with the UK as the UK now has with France. Now, sometimes when I've talked about Scotland, some people, I think none in the audience tonight, I'm sure, but some people <coughs> have been rude enough to say, who are you as an Englishman to discuss these matters with Scotland and tell us what to do? <coughs> you should keep off the grass and leave us to make our own decisions. <coughs> None of your business to give us advice. <coughs> well, fair enough. But in the European Union, people from 27 other states will not only be giving advice to Scotland, but telling her how she should organise her affairs in certain areas. The EU legislates for Scotland, and Parliament can do nothing about it. The supreme right to legislate and the power to impose certain taxes will be with Europe. And Holyrood will not be able to call Europe to account but will be in the position of a commentator on EU policy. Scotland, as I understand it, has a principle not of the sovereignty of Parliament, but the sovereignty of the people. And that was shown in the 2014 referendum and, of course, in the devolution referendum. Now, that principle cannot be maintained, in my view, if Scotland were to join the European Union. <laughs> so I come back to my book that uh, the conclusion of the book is that Brexit was not an aberration either of Britain or of the European Union. It's yesterday's issue in a way. And I think instead of saying it was a good thing or a bad thing, we should start to learn the lessons. And perhaps one good place to start learning the lessons is the Glasgow Philosophical Society. And so I look forward very much to your comments. Thank you for listening to me. <laughs>
for a European orientation could gives her a separate role from that of the rest of the United Kingdom, of course. But um, uh, the position of many people in Ireland has been weakened, I think, because, for example, there was for a long time after Irish independence, there was discrimination against the minority Catholic population of Northern Ireland. Now, had Irish MPs as a whole been at Westminster, there'd have been a very powerful pressure group on their behalf. And that wasn't there. Now, of course, there's no similar problem in Scotland. But look, you're saying, you see what they're saying, or your question is saying, really, and I put this in an article in the Daily Telegraph. There's a marriage which has gone on for 300 years. It's very, very irritating. And there are a few marriages that at some point that people aren't irritated. And perhaps there are many in which one of the partners says, I, I'd like to leave. But do you leave a marriage to be not on your own, but to have 27 other mistresses? Now, I mean, you know, some of these mistresses are far away. Isn't Latvia? Uh, or, or Poland or Slovenia, are they going to be actually interested in Scotland's needs? Their needs are quite different from those of Scotland. And um, as I say, um, some of Scotland's powers in fisheries, agriculture, go back to the EU. Um, so you get less devolution than you've got under Westminster, under the current system. So I can't see it. I'd have more sympathy in a way. I wouldn't support it, but I'd have more sympathy if Scott said, well, we want independence, but not in the, we don't want an outside body. We've got full confidence around our own affairs. We don't need to be helped by an outside body like the EU. And that was the SNP's position in 1975. I mean, it's odd now that when the EU is much more integrated, they say, well, we'd like to be integrated with them too. That's not, it, it just strikes me as rather odd. Somebody has asked, should the UK also be built on a confederal basis in the way you were suggesting might be suitable? Could, that, could you see that, Vernon, happening? You can't have confederalism in Britain. Some people have argued for federalism, which I think is, is absurd because I think it doesn't suit England. But Scotland has a lot of the powers that a federal, that a uniform federal government would have. It's got very wide devolution. And um, I think the important thing now in our constitutional arrangements with regard to Scotland and Wales for that matter, is them to use the power they've got effectively. I mean, there are problems, as everyone knows, with education and health in Scotland. And it's arguable these powers aren't being used as effectively as they might be used. And it's important to say, you see, that um, this is a matter of UK concern. For example, the bit of a skills gap in Scotland because the government cut places in further education to pay for free university tuition. Now, if there's a skills shortage in Scotland, which I think there is, it's a matter of concern for the whole United Kingdom. And we, we, I mean, the British government, I think, might should do something about it, uh, actually. Uh, I'm not sure the EU would be very bothered, frankly. We've got another question on about the EU and the UK. Should the UK treat the EU as a country or an international organisation, as far as diplomatic recognition is concerned? No, it's, it's more than a, an international organisation. I, I think we want good relations with the EU, and I, I don't think there's any point in having pinpricks. I mean, there have been pinpricks on both sides, it's fair to say, not just the British government. I think, frankly, there have been more pinpricks on the EU side, but still, um, no, I, I, I see no reason against recognition. <laughs> Somebody is uh, challenging you. Uh, mm. Leslie Buchanan says, on a point of fact, yeah. the professor wildly overstates the power of the Commission, which is in fact the EU's bureaucracy, subject to control by both the Council of Ministers and the European Parliament. Both of these are elected directly and indirectly. My question is, can the professor not see that he advocates a council of despair where the UK leaves a multinational group run by consent to return to the joys of the nation state, which gave us 1914 and 39? Well, there are two points here. Firstly, on the commission, I agree its powers are not what it had under the law, but it is the only power that can initiate legislation. That is a key power. That's why I'd want the position suggested or position the question would like to see, I think, actually put into effect with the Commission being a secretariat of the Council of Ministers. I think that would regularise things and make the position much clearer. On the broader point, yes, I think it's a pity we left. I voted Remain and partly for the, well, mainly I think for the reason that um, the questioner gave, the EU is basically a peace project and it's not an economic or federal project in a way, and, and I wanted Britain to be part of that, but we're not, and we have to make the best of it. Uh, you know, and Brexit was was 
a mistake, but that argument's over now. It's yesterday's argument. Um, and we're not a nation state. We're a country of sometimes had four nations, actually three nations, Northern Ireland's in a nation. Uh, we've got three nations and a contested province. I think we've done quite well in holding nations together with Scotland over 300 years, Wales since 1536. Um, I don't think we've done too badly. Um, I think it's a, a pity to break up a marriage over irritations. One of the worst arguments used to break it up, I think, is that people don't like Boris Johnson. But Boris Johnson's prime minister for a given period of time. If you break up the union, you break it up forever. Now, other people wonder about the long-term future of the EU. Is it likely to have a long-term future? Other multinational unions like the Soviet Union have broken down and become separate countries again. Could that be the outcome? We might not want it, but could that happen? It could happen. I hope it doesn't. I mean, it, it, it might well happen, I think, if, for example, Marine Le Pen won the French presidential election, certainly a possibility, or perhaps if the AFD came to power in Germany, which I profoundly hope they won't. It could happen. I deeply regret it did happen, because I think the cause of uh, wars, as your previous question said, was, she's absolutely right, nationalism. And uh, my conception of the EU would contain nationalism through a, a con more confederal unit of people thinking about Europe, not just their own countries. So I profoundly hope the European Union doesn't break up, but of course it is a possibility. It's, it's, uh, it can't be excluded. Um, why did the principle of subsidiarity disappear? Yeah. Has it been retained? Do you think it would have been prevented or mitigated any of the problems? To my knowledge, it hasn't had much practical effect. I'm open to correction on this, but I don't think the courts have used it to strike down um, uh, European Union laws. Um, but I'm open to correction. Others may know more about this than I do. Could, could uh, I got a question. Could, could we play a, a constructive role, even though we're outside the EU, could we play some sort of constructive role in helping Europe rethink its whole agenda. We, I mean, we're used to historically playing a part in Europe, trying to keep the people from warring each other and holding a balance of power. And we still have a lot of respect and influence, um, maybe when this government has changed. Well, yes, I think we should be, be constructive. I think particularly on defence policy, we're the only nuclear power with the French. And I think we should certainly cooperate with the French and other European countries on defence and foreign policy if we can. More generally, if President Macron's idea of concentric circles comes in, he did say Britain would have a place in such a Europe if there were such a Europe and with a loose outer ring, we might well find a place there. We haven't got a place in the current integrated Europe, but we might have a place in that. And I mean, I'm in very much in agreement with your, with the idea of your question of, of, of a bit of us making a constructive approach to Europe, yes. And what's happened to bodies like the EEA, somebody else wants to know? Well, yes, that's um, Norway's um, part of that, and that the EEA is in the internal market, but not the customs union. And the problem with that is that um, that requires free movement of people. And of course, one of the motives behind the Brexit vote was we don't want the free movement of people. Now, the internal market would give us closer access than what we've got at the moment under the free trade agreement. But as I say, it involves free movement of people. It may be the Labour Party takes up that issue and argues the election for a closer relationship with Europe. What about the Council of Europe, Vernon? We're yeah, still that's that, aren't we? Yeah, that's, um, that's um, an intergovernmental body and the European Convention of Human Rights comes from the Council of Europe, not the European Union. That's an older instrument from about 1950, 51, um, which the Human Rights Act broadly brings into our law. The Scottish government actually incorporated it <coughs> into its system, excuse me. <coughs> um, that still exists, yes, but it, it has no, uh, the European Union is distinctive in it's a superior legal order to Westminster just as in America, the federal government is a superior legal order to that of the member states and in Australia, Canada, and so on. It's 
it's a distinctive organization. Um, it's obviously pretty confusing sometimes for the electorate to understand the range of these bodies. You hear people getting confused about human rights, where it comes from. Yes. It, it makes you wonder whether there's a, a better communication system would be helpful across Europe. There's a question here about Northern Ireland, which yep. is bugging a lot of people. Mm. Now I've lost it. But the um, question is, uh, the issue of Northern Ireland straddling the UK and EU customs, there's got to be a border somewhere, it seems to me, and everybody else. What, what do we do? Well, one of the sad things about Brexit is that it resurrects the Irish question. <laughs> And the whole point of the Good Friday Agreement was that it matters less whether you're a unionist or a nationalist. And um, one of the effects was that um, someone in Northern Ireland who wished could be an Irish citizen as an alternative to, or in addition to, being a British citizen. Now, the, um, the uh, Brexit resurrects that issue and it polarizes nationalists and unionists. And one issue in which it polarizes the question of the border. There obviously, as you say, must be a border with the EU. And that border could be in one of two places. It's either in the Irish Sea, which it is in effect at present, or it's on the island of Ireland. Well, the problem is if it's in the Irish Sea, it bisects the United Kingdom. And I wonder whether other countries put up with that. Would France agree to a customs border with Alsace-Lorraine or Italy with the Alto Adige? I think probably not. And it's after the grace period, some goods coming into Northern Ireland will need customs declarations. Now the unionists say, and I have some sympathy with them, this is unacceptable, it's one country. But as I say, you're faced with a binary choice. The border's either in the, in the Irish Sea or it's on the islands of Ireland. But haven't people tried to think of ways in which to mitigate the border a bit by having things like trusted traders? Because it's really about whether what we do about trade and if we could have a system whereby some people just were trusted to behave and fill out the forms without inspection, except for snap inspections from time to time, might it seem less of a problem? You can mitigate it, yes. And I wonder if you, the, the method you've suggested can stop smuggling or people taking advantage of different regulations. You see, suppose we have an agreement with the Americans, and we have the dreaded chlorinated chicken. Now, let's not get in the argument whether it's a good thing or not, but let's say we have a trade agreement with them. Now, the EU says, well, our standards don't let chlorinated chicken in. How can you ensure that people aren't sending chlorinated chicken from Great Britain to Northern Ireland? The only way you can do it is, I think, by checking it's the standards, not so much the customs duties, perhaps, but the standards, the regulations. As I say, it raises the question of where these checks are to take place. They have to be such checks, but they didn't actually take place at any border, wherever it is. You can have an electronic border, have the checks elsewhere, but the conceptual border must be somewhere. <clears throat> okay, another question um, from Jamie Burton. Isn't the problem that a genuine free market requires fiscal governance, which requires a political union? In other words, it is all or nothing, so long as the EU remains a free market union. No, look, you can, you can have free trade with anyone without it. And obviously you have to accept their rules if you want to trade with them. Um, if you're trading with, um, I don't know, um, let's say France, and they won't accept chlorinated chicken, obviously you have to accept that. But you don't need political unions to trade with. We, have, we can have free trade with Australia or New Zealand or Japan without getting into a political union with them. The element, the key element of the um, uh, EU is the Zolverine, the customs union. And the purpose for that is to create a political union and the customs union and then the internal single market. Those do require uh, political uh, supervision, if you like. But free trade doesn't. We, we were a free trade country from 1846. There wasn't any question of political union with the rest of the world. Could we now turn to the question of the Commonwealth? which you talk about in your book, mm. when, we, when we were debating whether to join or not, one of the big questions was, well, what about the preference for Commonwealth? Getting cheaper food mm. instead of having to pay the cap and having to pay for expensive yeah. 
But Vernon, I haven't noticed since we've left a great flooding of cheap food from the Commonwealth. Why not? Well, let's see. But look, um, the whole point, the common agricultural policy would have no point if food in Europe was cheaper than food outside. Okay. It only has point by keeping out cheaper food. But you wouldn't need a common agricultural policy if EU prices were lower. They're no. not. And therefore, it's open to us to have cheaper food. It's open to us to alter our system of agricultural subsidies back to the old efficiency payment system. We don't need to have guaranteed high prices. And uh, that was one of that. We were naturally a free trade nation from 1846 as a commercial and industrial nation. We had a small agricultural sector by contrast with the most of the countries in the EU, which is why they had the CAP. And it suited them, it didn't suit us. You see, what would have suited us would have been free trade uh, in agriculture, but uh, not in industry to shelter our inefficient companies. But of course, the Germans and French didn't want that. They wanted free trade where they had the advantage, but not uh, in agriculture where they had um, an uneconomic agricultural sector, large peasant sector, partly political reason for them to keep it strong. And so they had a policy which suited their needs, but not our needs and was there before we joined. The same with the common fisheries policy, which surely Scotland has suffered from, uh, which suits them, but not us. And that was the price we paid for getting in. One of the reasons why we were heavy net contributors always have. Yeah, so we... <laughs> I suppose I was sort of wondering whether New Zealand, Australia and Africa would, would suddenly see an opportunity to, to sell us more produce. At a... anyone, anyone of sense would buy food in the cheapest market. Yes. As, um, uh, as I say, our, our agricultural subsidy system before we joined Europe was a deficiency payments made by the government through the tax plan, which didn't involve higher prices, but paid the difference between what the food was on the market and what the farmers needed. Now, the government, as I understand it, is adopting a variant of that system uh, to encourage environmental protection. So we may be paying a little more for that. But obviously we can now buy in the cheapest market in terms of agricultural goods and in motor cars as well, as it happened. But yes, we, we, can, we can buy from where we want. <laughs> we no longer, other, it was a protected market, the agricultural market. Um, yes. With the common tariff. Let's talk about services for a minute. Yeah. I think you mentioned in your book there's some 300 services which yeah. were never really unified under yeah. membership. Yeah. So we were expected to accept free movement of capital and labor, but not of services. Yes. Wasn't that a big, I mean, yeah. uh, there's a bit of humbug there, you're right. Um, they wouldn't give, and you see, one of the reasons I, I, I thought we, we had a good deal in Europe because we had a balance and we had the opt-outs and things we didn't like. But they yeah. wouldn't give us that on free movement. They were dogmatic about it. But as you imply, they're not so dogmatic about free movement of services. You try setting up as an architect in France or Germany, or dare I say, as a hairdresser, you'll find lots of examinations and qualifications which are really forms of protection. And they, they might have given us, you see the EU always put forward high principles but these principles are very, very flexible when it suits their interest to be flexible, um, as Ms. von der Leyen <laughs> found out. And um, uh, so, you know, I think the, the Angela Merkel and the rest missed a trick there, but, uh, but perhaps Cameron wasn't thoughtful enough, who knows. But I think if we'd been given concessions on immigration, we'd have stayed in the EU. On the other hand, uh, Dr. Julie Armstrong says, that shared research and development in technological developments is a major success in the EU. And we've been a major leader in research and development. And it's good to have that, you know, on food regulation, environmental regulations, et cetera, shared intelligence. We're gonna be worse off, aren't we now? Well, you can do that without political union. If you look at research, the Israelis share a lot of research with Europe, they're not in the EU, we, we can do that. Um, and we, we, can, we can arrange bilateral agreements on particular things that we want to. Um, this, this is valuable, as the question says, but it doesn't necessarily require political union. Um, and that, I say, the presupposition of political union 
is that you feel part of one large community, which I don't think the British do. And I suspect, frankly, the Scots don't either, actually. But I may be wrong. Yes. Somebody's asked a question about the border between Scotland and England. Yep. Would it be like the border problem in Northern Ireland? Well, there'd be a hard border, of course, because Britain is outside the customs union and the um, uh, internal market. It's the hard Brexit, if you like, and therefore there must be some means of checking on my chlorinated chicken example. Suppose the rest of the UK signed an agreement with America, free trade agreement bringing chlorinated chicken, and the EU doesn't want chlorinated chicken. They'll have to stop that happening. And then there'd have to be passports because we don't have the free movement of peoples. So uh, there'd be, there are going to be, there are restrictions already on EU immigration, and those restrictions would apply to Scotland. So families and friends would be divided. It would be less so if we'd have a softer Brexit that liked Theresa May's, which kept us in the customs union. But even so, I think with different immigration policies, you'd need passports. Um, yes, it, it's a hard border, which um, I think lessens the case for Scottish independence, in, in my personal opinion. Obviously, the SNP doesn't agree, but that's my personal view. The harder the border, the less viable independence is, really. And it would divide a lot of families and friends. It's interesting, isn't it? That I've noticed that when we've got very, I mean, I'm just as bad, when we've got very complex discussions, people leap to a single image, like having to have straight cucumbers, which was Boris's thing. Yeah. And chlorinated chicken. Yeah. I wonder whether we don't fall into a trap where we use these things with, uh, they, uh, as tokens for something that they're not really able to carry. I was in America last year and talked to quite a lot of Americans and they were appalled to think they were eating chlorinated chicken. They said, we're not, where did you get this idea from? We wouldn't eat that. We're very keen on our food being pure. Now they may have been liberal West Coast people, but I do wonder sometimes whether we throw these things around instead of really trying to understand the issue. Well, that may be, but the standards and regulations of other countries are obviously different. Why should they not be America, yeah, yeah. America Japan, Australia, wherever you like to look, countries with which we trade. And the EU does insist on certain standards. They may be right, they may be wrong. You can argue it out. Some say they're protectionist, others say they're necessary for health and so on. But there's a difference. And therefore, the EU, we need to check this, why it has these standards. Um, it's a standard the same, the goods can go through, but they have to check. I mean, if, if there's no chlorinated chicken, the EU says, fine, this can come through. But I say they have to check to find out. And forms have to be filled in. So, and a lot of extra bureaucracy, another reason I was against, a lot of extra bureaucracy, uh, amount of your forms filled in and checked and so on, that's the cost of business. I mean, that's uh, one of the disadvantages of Brexit, I think. Right, well, Vernon, we're coming near to an end now. Yeah. Could I, and we've had lots of interesting questions. I've managed to get most of them in. Could, could you sum up, you, could you mention very, very nicely at the beginning that you were pleased to be speaking to this 219 year old philosophical society. Could you leave us with a, two or three thoughts on what we as a society should be over the next two or three years trying to promote by way of discussion and debate to try and move this forward in some creative way? Well, I think there probably does need to be a discussion about the constitutional future of the United Kingdom. Not, I think, so much Scotland, but how England should have devolution for itself, if that's what you're interested in. I think another discussion is very worrying about Scotland, the educational standards, particularly skills, as I've mentioned, um, but also, I think, standards in the schools. But uh, one of the problems we have outside Brexit is that we're much more dependent on our skills and our brains. And if you look at those countries that have broadly successful economic in the modern world, places like Singapore, um, Taiwan, Hong Kong, and so on, they've got very few natural resources, but they, they use their brains. They place a very high premium on education, which traditionally the Scots have done much more than the English. And um, if the Scots could tell us how to adopt a, a more radical skills policy, um, that would be doing a lot of good. You see that the model the Brexiteers had um, was really um, a model, a, a kind of Thatcherite model. 
that outside the EU, we could be more competitive, we deregulate, we reduce subsidies and tariffs, we would uh, ideally, before COVID, reduce personal and corporate taxes to get entrepreneurs here, to make us a kind of Singapore or New Zealand or Australia, whatever it is. Now, that probably won't happen, but whatever sorts of policy you adopt, we do need much greater skills and adaptability, which we haven't got. It's been a problem Britain as a whole has faced, less so Scotland, I think, for many, many years. And if you could do something about that and suggest a skills policy, both for Scotland and the rest of the country. So we've got wonderful universities, our universities, both in England and in Scotland, Edinburgh, Glasgow, other universities, amongst the best in the world, no question. But we do badly on those who are interested in technical and vocational education, always have done. We look down on people that are sort of dirtying their hands, as it were. We do very badly there. We do well academically, but not on this other end. And this is, I think, something you might look at, really. Well, thank you for that. We, that's a very good point, and we'll take that up. Right. And now, on behalf of all the people, we've had a hundred and over 140 people joining in. I'd like to thank Professor Bogdanov for a most interesting, stimulating talk, and especially on the, the Q&A part at the end. I hope you... Uh, I'd love to uh, give you a bottle of whiskey or something. <laughs> <laughs> It'll have to be not a bit of a moment. No, I'm, I much enjoyed it. Thank you. I'm sorry I wasn't able to be in Glasgow. It's a wonderful city. But um, uh, before passports are needed, I'm sorry I couldn't come. But uh, another time, I hope. <laughs>